hello everybody. We've got most people on the call. There's about 46 of you. Good afternoon and um, I'm hoping you have a gin and tonic, a love of tennis and this fantastic opportunity to have an hour off work and without the children. So that has to be good. <laughs> now guys, do you remember that flat surface, the one that has the net in the middle and lines around the outside? Um, I think it is a tennis court. A lot of us certainly here in Singapore haven't seen one for a couple of months as it is locked down absolutely here. But we are going to bring you the thing that we can get closest to regarding tennis and that is a 22 time Grand Slam champion. And please put your hands together Together, as we welcome Todd Woodbridge, who joins us from Australia in Melbourne. Hi, Todd. Hey, Kate. How are you going? I, I presume everybody can hear me. Can you all hear me? I believe that they can. Yes. So thumbs right. up from everybody. Um, terrific yeah. to have you here. Now, Todd, a little bit of housekeeping. I have my very glamorous assistant, Ash, who's manning the Zoom controls. Yes. And uh, so he's on that. He's got his gin and tonic. He's looking forward to having a chat with you. Uh, so I'm, got a pinot. You've got a pinot. Okay, very civilised. Mm. Uh, that's, uh, that's rather good. I think we've got a selection of drinks going on this afternoon because it's seven <laughs> o'clock in Australia. A couple it of is, hours. Yeah. Early dinner. It's been dark for a couple of hours already. That's why the lighting's a little bit, you know, yellow here in my office. But I brought my old partner along with me tonight, present in the picture over my shoulder. Um, and that is a very impressive backdrop. I mean, my goodness me, there's a fair few trophies there. I don't think all of your trophies are there, that's for sure. But no, no, this is about a third of them. I've got another cabinet over this way over here. Um, but you might see in the corner there, right about my thumb is a Davis Cup trophy right there. Uh, we've got a couple of Olympic medals just underneath, right sort of in that spot there. Are, uh, four of my Wimbledon doubles trophies. Um, the rest of my big stuff is actually at the Kuyon Lawn Tennis Club. So I've got about two thirds of them on display there. My word, 83 titles that you've had. And Todd, 10 of those came at Wimbledon, which I know holds a really special place in your heart. And for many of us that had the chance to go to Wimbledon, it's in a few weeks time and it's not happening for the first no. time in my goodness me. I can't remember when, um, you've got to be very sad about that. I am. I just, I put about like eight minutes ago, I posted on Instagram a picture. I just saw this picture come up of um, an outside court looking back at, at the center court with the ivy clad, you know, members enclosure, all of that, and thinking it looked unbelievable. I'm thinking, no, it's actually the first time I haven't been to Wimbledon since I was 16 years of age. Um, so it's going to be. It's going to be rough. <laughs> it's going to be really difficult. And I mean, as a, as a little kid, I dreamt about going there. I never thought I'd really be able to, you know, do the things that I've done there. But that was the goal. The goal was to go there. The next goal was to play there. The next goal was to maybe win something there. And then the final goal, I guess, was to see if you could ever become a member of the club. So those things I ticked along as we, we slowly went through, Kate. And you're a member of the club, which... Yeah. Now, how did yeah. that come about? We assumed that you would become a member of the club after winning your first doubles Grand Slam championship, but it's not that straightforward. No, no, no. Never assume anything with the All England Club. Um, the easiest way to win the champion, or oh, sorry, the easiest way to become a member is to win the singles championship. That's the only way that you get an honorary membership. So the rest comes through family or maybe playing Davis Cup for GB um, or Fed Cup or, or if you're a woman. And... Um, there is no protocol for doubles. So when Mark and I won, you know, three in a row, four in a row, five in a row, nothing came in the mail. Then we had a couple of years off where we didn't win the championship. We won our sixth in the year 2000 and still nothing. And you go, oh my God, what are you going to do to get in this place? And eventually out of the blue, yeah, it was still in the days of the, the, the little letters that had the, the blue and red stripes around them, you know, like almost an aerogram arrived in the mail. I was living in Orlando said nothing from where it was from and it was just this plain letter that said you know dear mr woodbridge the committee would like to invite you to become a member of the club do you accept the offer <laughs> i mean it's like it's not like you're gonna say no is it <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway that that's how it came about after our sixth win and mark was retiring so it, it took six doubles titles 
Wow, six doubles titles. And what do you, what are the benefits of being a member? I can imagine that there are lots. Well, I mean, I can go back there any time. So I can, I can go all year round. It's my club. Um, I don't pay dues. That's a good thing because I'm honorary, but I can't vote, can't nominate anybody. Um, but I get two magnificent seats on Centre Court and Court One every year. They're my seats. They don't change. Um, and I'm able to put, you know, my friends, guests into those seats. And, um, you know, I guess that in itself is, uh, is unique. Um, more recently, uh, the last couple of years, I'm, I'm actually caught up with you last year. Um, uh, I've actually got to, to visit the Royal Box. I've sat in for the last two semi-finals. So you remember, everyone remember that epic semi-final that um, went on for days and days um, with Anderson um, and Isner. Um, I watched that and then we watched Rafa and Novak not finish that night um, from the Royal Box. That was quite funny, watching all the Royals come in and out. And uh, uh, that was a really interesting one that night. So uh, Princess Michael of Kent, it was getting so late and people were leaving. She rings, rings the hubby up, Prince Michael of Kent, and says, come on down, there's a seat for you now. So he came in late. He wasn't even invited that day. So even the Royals were coming in when they weren't meant to. Oh, that was quite unique that day. God, yes, all sorts arrive in the Royal Box. It's so exciting when you know that play's about to get underway and they have that shot of the Royal Box and who's yeah. going to be joining the players. Yeah. Now, Todd, you have won a staggering 10 titles at Wimbledon, mm. uh, more than Roger Federer, who holds the record for eight singles mm. championships there. So what is it about Wimbledon that brings out the very best in you? I know. I mean, I, I'd be interested to see what people think. How many should I give back to win just one singles? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, but you are very good. Now, we know all about how good you are as a doubles player and your fantastic yeah. combination with Mark Woodford. But you also got pretty far at Wimbledon back in the late 90s. Yeah, a lot of people forget um, I was a reasonably good singles player. And, and coming from Australia, um, this is the thing I love about tennis is we don't, we, we were never brought up to play doubles. And I, and I never consider myself a doubles player, although I've got the accolades for that. We were brought up to play singles, doubles, and mix. In fact, at Wimbledon, um, the very first, tour like, first tournament that I went to, I played the juniors, but I qualified for the mix. So my first time there, I played out at Roehampton, and I got to play on the main courts, get my players badge, and you just go, oh, this is great. But that's because I played everything. I think in my last junior year, I'm um, one of the only players that I know of uh, that's ever played five events at Wimbledon. I played... The, uh, the main draw in singles, doubles and mix, and I play the main draw in the junior singles and doubles all in those two weeks. I just was going on court all day long. It was brilliant. But, but you know, to, to go to Wimbledon, that was my dream. To win Wimbledon singles, well, that was the ultimate dream. That didn't happen, but I did make a semi-final back in 97. Uh, um, I beat Michael Chang in the opening round. I beat Pat Rafter uh, in the 16s, I think it was. Um, and then I lost to uh, the eventual champion, the seven-time champion, Pete Sampras, in the semis. But I will throw um, something out to the group here, a little bit of a trivia one. I'm not going to answer it straight away. Um, who is my best win in Wimbledon singles? We might get back to that a little later, Kate, because that was quite a, a good win. So um, he didn't lose very often at the championships, I'll put it that way. Okay, now everybody is feverishly tapping away on their phone. <laughs> that desperately find that answer would be the first one to respond. Yeah. No, Todd, yeah. we have. It is, uh, so many people have donated. Uh, we've raised over $3,500 for the COVID migrant workers. Yeah. So well, well done, done everybody. everybody. And, uh, yeah, you're quite the attraction, Todd. When I mentioned I was catching <laughs> up with you, it was... Um, so you've got half of the British club here, which is a, a, yep. a tennis club. And you've got a number of tennis coaches. We've got right. uh, a couple of friends from Australia, a couple of friends and family from the UK. So everybody's very keen uh, to have a chat and to hear what you've got to say. So the, we're going to actually ask a few people to ask questions to you directly, if but that's all right. Now, hang yeah. on, my glamorous assistant, Ash. Uh, he's going to, yeah, he's there. Good day, he says. And um, we're going to open up the space to Kate Sherrard. Now, Kate is here in Singapore, very keen on her tennis. And let's see if we can get to Kate. Kate, we're going to open up your microphone. Okay. Um, I think, what's I the question? Think, I think you can hear me. Um, yeah. Got you, Kate. Well, yeah. <laughs> first of all, um, 
Kate, thank you for arranging for uh, Todd to come and visit me in my home. This is definitely the most excitement that I've had in, <laughs> some months in, in lockdown. Um, so, Todd, my, my question to you is, um, assuming you came out of retirement, who would you most like to beat and on which court? Oh, assuming I came out of retirement. Yeah. Ah. Uh, I mean, there's only really one answer to that, I think, and that would be to be Roger on the centre court at Wimbledon. Um, can you imagine uh, getting out there and playing him? Now, that's a bit over the top, but to be able to do that... Um, the, Federer, for me, is, is the greatest player that's ever played the game. He may not end up with the greatest record. I think Djokovic is probably going to pass him. Um, Rafa is unique in the way that he goes. We've got the James Bond in Federer. You've got the bull and the tenacity of Rafa. And then you've got that little quirkiness of Novak. Um, but no one has been more fluid and graceful and move as well. And really, in my opinion, has been better on every surface. Um, if Rafa hadn't won, what, 12, 13 Frenches, Roger would have won four or five. He would have had a, a, a better record than Novak on all of those surfaces. So um, there's always if, if buts and maybes. That, that's a little bit of a chat about those three. Um, but if, if there was ever a match that you'd want to play, I could probably even lose a tight match to Federer on centre court and still be happy. Okay, um, thank you. A very good question. And I, Roger Federer, he, you call him the James Bond of tennis. Yeah. Is he as nice in person as he comes across when he's on the tennis court and after you get to have a chat with him and the post-match interviews on television? 100%. Um, he is exactly like we see him in our, in our interviews when you see him chat. Um, he's quite mischievous. I've never really come across a champion like him. And I've met a lot of them, you know, in tennis in the locker room prepping for matches, who actually is re as relaxed as he is. Um, he just takes everything so coolly. And I think that's one of the reasons he's, you know, so brilliant and had such longevity. He doesn't seem to get uptight about things. So he, um, you know, and he's like James Bond. You know, it's all, all, look at the people that sponsor him. It's about champagne. It's about chocolates. It's about Mercedes Benzes. It's, it's every brand in the world that every athlete wishes that they could have, you know. Um, that's the way it goes. You know, he's Mercedes-Benz and, and I'm a Kia. That, that's how it goes. <laughs> a Rafa's a Kia too. I shouldn't say it like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Roger Federer, I got saw a program on him last year and he was uh, climbing the Swiss Alps with Bear Grylls. I mean, is there anything the guy can't do? And he's 38, Todd. I mean, yeah. that's some of us here hope that we can still attempt to play decent tennis. What does he yeah. have to be able to win at 38? Well, this, this is going to be like, if I can take a, a step forward just for a moment on that, Kate, is that um, what we're all going through right now with this COVID thing, I just wonder, though, if we may have seen the end of him winning these big events. I think, he, you know, he should have won Wimbledon last year. He's, he's had match points and lost it. Um, that's his best chance of winning a major, I think, at this point moving forward. He misses this year. He comes back at nearly 40. And I don't see that he can sustain seven matches um, if they're best of three sets, yes, but we're not going to do that. Um, so that, that's the unique thing about what's happening right now is that with, with COVID, um, in tennis and the records, if you look at the records, uh, amateur tennis started in 1969 and all of the records up to that point were very important. And then we had the open era up until now. I think we're going to have post-COVID records as well because I think this has put a real line in the sand about um, maybe that discussion of who's the greatest, um, can Roger win again? I think it's going to be really, really hard for him. It's a great shame that there aren't any tennis events this year, majors. I mean, you talked about mm. the French potentially being postponed. Wimbledon has been cancelled. But Todd, there yeah. is an event taking place in the UK at the end of June, and it's a battle yeah. of the Brits that's mm. organised by Jamie Murray. It's going to be behind closed doors. So talk yeah. us through, how are we going to liven up the atmosphere when there are no crowds? Uh, Judy course. will do that, that's for sure. Huh? Judy Murray will get in there and do some dancing with the stars and all sorts of things like that. I'm sure she'll shake it up for us. <laughs> hey, you've been on Dancing with the Stars, so you could pop <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't a segue for that. I didn't mean that. <laughs> um, it's, that's, the, that's the thing that's going to be really different. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing Andy back out in court because um, uh, when you get to watch him, I, I, I'm... I'm a big fan of Andy Murray. Um, I'm not such a fan of his whining, but I was a whiner too, so I can, I can really relate to that. Um, but I, when you watch the discipline that the guy had, how hard he's worked, what he's actually achieved in that era, I've talked about that era of those very amazing players, yet he won 
uh, two Wimbledons, a US Open and two Olympics in that period. That's extraordinary to be able to do. So um, I'm looking forward to, to seeing that event. But I think that's a bit of a push it, push it back a little bit to the US Open. And they are really in these last couple of days talking about US Open being up and running. <clears throat> I'm not so sure how that's going to happen. But one person with each player, whether that be a coach or a physio or a wife or whatever, only one person allowed to travel, no fans. It's going to be really strange. And I wonder, I don't know, like you guys are all tennis fans and I've played these. I'm not so sure that I would really want to win a US Open under those circumstances. I just think it makes it so different and I don't know that we really want that. I'd love to see tennis tournaments up, but I don't know if I want to see majors won in that way just yet. It's an interesting point. And the Battle of the Brits is featuring the top eight. I'm sure there'll be something similar happening in Australia. Yeah. Yeah, we're trying to do the same thing. In fact, we had a tournament was due to go last weekend in Adelaide, um, and it had on the men's side Kyrgios, Milman, Jordan Thompson, and Thanasi Kokkinakis, uh, Ash Barty, Sam Stoza, uh, Priscilla Hon, and Dasha Gavrilova were all going to compete. And um, the South Australian health officials knocked that on the head uh, 48 hours out, uh, and we weren't allowed to travel interstate to be able to do it. So I was going to have to drive across and commentate. Um, so we've still got a few of those issues here, but that's the same sort of thing that we'll get up here hopefully within the next maybe four to six weeks. Mm, yes, and uh, yeah, surely social distancing, tennis lends itself very well, a bit like golf, and as long as you only touch your own balls, then you're okay, which I know is the subject <laughs> of um, several memes that have uh, been shared on so, social media. So, so Kate, you and I are both, um, are both broadcasters, commentators now, so one of my really bad days um, in the booth happened at the US Open, because I'm not sure if any of you know, I'll go off tangent very slightly, um, at the US Open, um, the, the men's and women's singles are played with two different... Um, types of balls. The US, the US Open uses Wilson, the men use heavy duty, and the women use regular. And they play quite a bit different. They're quite a bit faster, the, the, the women's one, and the men's one gets a little heavier. Um, but when you play the mixed at that tournament, the women have to change. And I, I was trying to explain all of this on air one day, and the best that I came up with was when, um, when the women play mixed, they have to play with the men's balls. <laughs> And that's how I came across. It was exactly the same verbatim. Um, I survived. I, I got through. I didn't get you know, taken down out to the broadcast compound and said, your career is over. Oh, that's brilliant. I love it. I love it. The things that we have said um, on air. Now, you've talked about tennis in Australia. And uh, there is an Aussie here in Singapore who loves her tennis. That's Emma Pike. And Emma's a member of the British Club. Very useful, not just with a tennis racket, but also a squash racket. And uh, oh. Emma. Uh, your chance to ask Todd a question. Yeah, thanks, Kate, and thanks for putting this on. And hi, Todd. Yeah, um, Emma. My question for you is: is because you have been so successful in doubles and being an Aussie, is there a bit of banter on tour where you get the singles guys against the doubles guys, and the doubles the singles guys kind of giving it to you, giving you a little bit of shit for being a doubles player? Yes, yes, at times there was. I mean, there was a crossover period in my career where that started to happen. And I, you can probably tell I didn't like it very much by my early, earlier comment. Um, but I, I can relate to one match in particular. I played Davis Cup match for Australia with Mark Woodford. Uh, gosh, the year must have been about 97 or 8, I think. And we played the United States in Washington. And um, there was all of this discussion because... Mark and I had to play against Pete Sampras and Todd Martin. They were the number one and number three players in the world at that point in the singles rankings. And Mark and I are about number one or two in the doubles. So people thought, oh, they're the best players in the world. There's no chance that I'll be able to beat, um, that the Woodies will be able to beat them. It doesn't work that way. And um, the good news was we, we dropped the first set, but then we came back and won in four. And that match was huge because that was sort of like a, I had to you know, pull your chest out and prove to people that your skill set in that part of the game was actually better than, let's say, Pete Sampras at one, you know, was the record holder of Grand Slams by the end of his career. So um, that, that was really, really important. So when, you, when we won that match, the, the, to answer your question, there was no way they could come and say that to us anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You put them in their place, basically. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> you have to use, use the wand to actually tell them, show them. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, your magic wand, thanks Emma, your magic wand being your tennis racket, of course, there, Todd. Yes, yes, and, um, yes. Talking about your relationship and your partnership with Mark Woodford, uh, there is a question from Dirk. And if Dirk is joining us this afternoon, he did say he had to go to work earlier. So hopefully right. he's taking a break from shipbroking and uh, he's able to join us this afternoon. I know a few are trying to slouch off work that little bit earlier. Uh, no, oh, he's no, not there at the moment. He's not there at the moment. We might have to ask the question for him because he did send it through to me. So you have a very special relationship with Mark Fulford. Uh, he wants to know, did you ever have any on-call dust-ups with him? Oh, uh, occasionally. Um, yeah, occasionally. Like, we have two quite different personalities. Um, but we gelled really well. We're on the same page with, with our goals and everything we wanted to do. And over a 10-year period, on average, we won every fourth tournament. So when there was a blue and something brewing, a win would always make that feel a little bit better. Um, so... But, but there were moments in matches when you're both getting a little edgy that I remember I, often I would get in front of him to try to hit a shot. I think there's a short ball I would take off and think, that's mine, that's my forehand, get out of my way. It's like, right, mate, you know. But I think the beauty of our relationship was actually we, we had this ability to both lead. And a lot of people thought when he retired and the Woodies partnership ended that I would struggle. Um, but they didn't know the depth of who drove who in our relationship. And when things were sort of um, low for us, I had this ability to get fired up and drive and get aggressive and, and push and chuck a bit of a tantrum, but change momentum. Um, Mark was always the very cool, calm, collective one. So under pressure, if I got too much, he could pull me back. But when he was too flat, I had to get him going. And so, so that whole relationship and personality thing was all really important to us to be able to be as successful as we were. So the, the, the blues were not um, major. So, so that's a good thing, you know, but you still have to have a bit of friction to drive each other. Yeah, it was interesting to see how well you complement each other. But were there any other, any matches where you went, oh, I would have won that had it not been for Mark at that point? No, no, no not really. That was probably the other Kate. It was probably more like, had we have not had that, uh, we used to struggle in early rounds, first rounds, early rounds of tournaments. We, in fact, were down match point, uh, first round of the US Open one year, went on to win the tournament. That was sort of the things that were really good for us, is that we actually had the opposite um, to that effect. So we were lucky. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Dirk, he has joined us now. He has managed to sneak off from shipbroking. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, Dirk. Uh, Todd, get fired up on court. Sounds like something Obama would say. I like it. <laughs> um, now, Fiona, also a member of the British Club. Uh, she joins us this afternoon. I think Ash is working his way. Is. Oh. I've got Fiona in the bottom left here. Go, I Fiona. Unmute. I've unmuted myself. Hi there, Todd. I was just Googling to see what age you were because I uh, did actually see you win in 93, I think, at Wimbledon. Yep, first year. So, yeah, I think so. Um, and uh, I used to love what men's doubles has always been my favourite. Uh, so uh, I remember queuing up for Wimbledon with all those people in the long queues trying to get in with the rabble. Uh, yes. Um, I just you wanted to ask because... You would have been a schoolgirl back then, Fiona. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I, I, it's nice of you to say that, but uh, <laughs> if Wikipedia's right, I'm actually a little bit older than you are. <laughs> Uh, I'm pleased to say still playing um, and I like a lot of the girls uh, on tonight uh, play a lot of ladies doubles and I wanted to ask you because you were talking about you just mentioned about being in one match point down and then going on to win yes. and um, I was going to ask about uh, when you're playing so for example you play the first set and maybe you win quite comfortably and it's keeping that momentum going because typically you end up losing the second so how, how do you keep that, you know, and you think, oh, I've got to play a third set and hopefully you win in that third set. But I find situations where you win comfortably in the third and then you lose the second. And then you're saying, come on. So it's all about, um, well, there are several parts to that. Um, but the real thing I'm hearing from you is about momentum and how you hold and keep that yeah. momentum. So um, what you have to do is when you win that first set, often you'll go, oh, Oh, well done. Geez, we played great, didn't we? And, you, and everything drops. So what, what you have to do is, whether you change ends and have your drink and towel off as you would in Singapore, for sure, 
it's about then talking to your partner and actually owning up to that fact that here we go, this is going to be our normal thing where we drop our bundle and lose concentration. So you get to each other, you talk about it, verbalize it, verbalize it and say, I think I'm losing my concentration. When that happens, that releases a bit of the nerves and stress and pressure that you would start to feel. And then the other part that you can think about is what we would do in those situations as players is A, I would try to up my intensity at that point. I would really try to sort of in those first three games of the second set, really sort of move my feet a lot and, and, uh-huh. and be in the face of the opponents, right? But if you're feeling that you've dropped your level, you need to lengthen the time between points. So you can't, there's only so much time you can take, but don't rush. Actually wait and lengthen that period till you get the momentum again and then you shorten those points. So if you're serving and you've got the momentum, make them play to your pace. But, but that's what the great players do. And you'll watch them, how they orchestrate the umpire, a towel, the ball going somewhere. That's deliberate because they know how they're feeling internally. So when you go you sort of have your celebration and go, oh, isn't that good? You've got to stay on it. And um, we've all been through that. We all do that, you know. Um, so, so there are a couple of little things to think about. It, increase your intensity for those first three games of the second set. Get ahead because your opponents are already going, oh, my goodness, how are we going to get out of this? And then if you are feeling that, just take your time. Don't, don't let the momentum go quickly to their side. Some great tips there. I've been writing that down as you've been oh. speaking. <laughs> and, uh, thank you, Kieran. Thank I think half of the, the tennis teams at the British Club have just been writing all that down. And, uh, We're going to see, like, after every first set, everybody's going to be going hyper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Leaping up and down. Everson, our tennis coach, is also on the Zoom as well. So I know he'll most likely be uh, nodding in agreement and thinking that's um, excellent advice. So, Todd, you are a superb tennis player, and we are now going to invite not quite such a good tennis player to ask you a question. That would be Will Jelf. Now, Jelfy, my lovely, you've managed to also nip out from that last uh, Zoom call to join us this afternoon. Uh, do you, what's your question for Todd? Uh, thanks, KB. Hi, Todd. How's it going? Uh, yeah, you, good. you just got some great advice on how to maintain momentum, but I want to ask you, as, as someone who's the greatest doubles player ever, going right to the other end of the spectrum, where I am, for some truly terrible doubles player, have you, <laughs> have you got any top advice, top tips, please? Any would be welcome. Well, what did you, can I have a bit more input about why you feel like you're that bad? Well, I guess, I guess I'm talking about sort of inter-family rivalry, you know, me and my wife versus my brother and sister-in-law. Um, yeah. I don't see it as simply as a game of singles tennis with someone else on the court. Right. Uh, oh, man, I could get into all sorts of trouble. Um, <laughs> I don't know where to go with this one. Um, <laughs> but what, like, here, here's a couple of things that, um, that you might be able to use, not necessarily with your play with your family. But one of the great things about playing doubles is it's not about me. It's not how good I am. It's not how good a shot I hit. It's not the ace I serve or the winner I hit. It's how I set my partner up. So here's a way for you to really win. If you can get something in the nice part of the court, set the misses up for an easy put away volley. I mean, the world's your oyster. And, and, and you, might, you might laugh at that and think, but that's how we actually, that's how I think. As, as a pro, I set a return up so that my partner can knock the volley off at the net. Um, I serve to a part of the court so that, again, my partner can get that volley. And so it's always about a little bit of planning and working in a combination. So, um, you know, that's that part. And then the next part is communication, which between married couples on the court can sometimes be quite difficult. Um, but, but communication is the key. Making each other just feel um, uh, as good as you can. Uh, you know, I played with my sister-in-law. Uh, her name was Nicole Bradkey. Um, some of the Australians out there would know. Nicole Provis, Nicole Bradke. Um, she made the semifinals of the French uh, singles in 1988 and was a Wimbledon um, mixed runner-up, won the Australian mixed. Um, so a very, very good player. And I um, ended up playing a few times with her. And because we were family, I had to play the backhand court. It was not my side. And we were playing Wimbledon one year and I was having a lot of trouble making returns uh, on break points. She was giving me one, two, three, four. And in the end, she just turned around and said to me, would you just make it? Uh, and I never made another one after that. So, you know, that communication and being nice to your partner can also help. <laughs> right, so that's a good note to you, Jelfie. Be <laughs> 
That's lesson number one. The next time you're on the tennis court. Yeah, the one, one last one. one. One last one, Kate, is if, if you're not going so well with that partner, just get a better partner. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, Claire will be looking for a new husband very shortly. Then. <laughs> Look forward to that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Will. Jelf, excellent to have you along this afternoon. Jelfie will be hitting that tennis court. We all will. We're desperate to play golf here in Singapore. Todd, uh, and tennis. Back on the tennis. Oh, even, yeah, even, and that too, actually. Both <laughs> golf and tennis. Uh, we're not allowed near either of those sports uh. right now. Um, we got a question in as well from Perks. So this is Andy Perkins, who lives um, on Super Sentosa. And Perky, what's your question for Todd? Yeah, hi, hi there, Todd. Um, hey, folks. I would like to know uh, if you could pick three players, past or present, to make up a social beer sort of friendly doubles game. Who would it be, and why? Oh. I'm probably verging down the sort of banter, you know, better beers yeah. as opposed to you know superb tennis. Yeah, let me start by saying, as a young kid, um, I, I had the most surreal experience, and it answers this question, but we'll get to a, 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 another time. I was um, 18 years of age, I just got my driver's license, I, I grew up in Sydney. Um, John Newcomb uh, was sort of helping in a way, and he said, come over to my place and we'll work on your surf, as John Newcomb does. And um, so I drive over to Nuke's place, the other side of Sydney, I get to his house, got a beautiful court in his backyard, um, we do a few serves and things. He says, oh, I've got a couple of mates coming over to play some doubles. Do you want to join us? And I said, oh, yeah. And I said, who, who are the mates? He said, uh, well, I'll play with Tony Roach and you can play with Ken Rosewell. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and can you imagine? I'm 18 years, of old, uh, 18 years of age. I've got these absolute legends. And I played doubles for two hours um, on John Newcomb's backyard court. That still is one of the greatest days of my life. To get to the, the point that you're making, though, um, I didn't really get to play much with Rod Laver. I'd love to play with him. Um, Mansur Barami, if any of you have come across Mansur, the trick shot artist, he's highly entertaining and great fun and makes tennis now for me uh, so enjoyable. He, he would be brilliant. Um, and then, yeah, then it's interesting. Um, you know, I, I don't know who else I would pick. I, I, I've actually become quite a good mate with Goran Ivanisevic. Um, I, I feel like I've connected with him. I, I didn't get along with him at all when we played. Post-play, I think he has actually shown the world who he really is. And he's a fun guy, good entertainment on the court and off the court. So um, it's a bit of a different group than maybe what you'd expect. But for those reasons, that might be who I'd pick right now. Thanks. Great, thanks. Good question, Perky. Thank you very much. Um, Todd, who was horrible to play against? Andre Agassi. Really? Mm. Um, because tennis is all about matchups and how you go against a certain person's style, your strengths to their weaknesses, vice versa. And my game style to him was um, chop chop. Um, he, everything I did, he just did so much better. So it was so hard for me to play against him. Every other great player um, around those times, I used to win sets off. I, I had wins over, you know, Courier. Uh, uh, Stick, Krychek, um, uh, uh, who else? Well, I'm not going to say one other because that's in that question that I asked earlier. Um, but multiple, multiple top 10 players at their best. Agassi, I, I couldn't win a set. And so that was quite frustrating. He's, he, he wrote a very good book, didn't he? Have, have you he read it? He did. Him? He did. Um, and I know we've got a couple of kids here. I'll try and get this one over their head. Um, <laughs> but there's a great story in, um, that, that I have in his book. Um, he was having troubling times um, with, with taking a few tablets. And um, I, my wife and I were flying from uh, Orlando to Atlanta to Stuttgart, which is around the time in his book that he talks about these issues um, coming up in his life. And he played Malavia, Washington and lost the plot at that tournament. But I got on a, a business class flight with my wife overnight and it was really sort of strange because Andre walks on and he never flew commercially, always flew privately. And he gets on and he saw us, was not many there, and he sat next to me, I go, you know, mate, and we chatted. And he chatted, 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 chatted for about three or four hours to the point of, I'm sorry, mate, but I need to get some sleep. And he goes, yeah, sorry, sorry, of course you do. And I got a little bit of sleep. 
woke up and he said, well, I'm so sorry, I kept you awake all night. Um, I've got a couple of sleeping pills for you if you need to, you know, get in and get a good sleep before we, we start the tournament. I said, no, I'm okay. He said, no, take him anyway, just in case. So we put him in our little sidekick and that was all good. And two weeks later, uh, we finish in Paris Indoor. We're flying back home again and Tash and I couldn't sit next to each other. So um, she decides it was a daytime flight to take one of the sleeping pills. However, um, it wasn't a sleeping pill. And she had a massive um, reaction to this pill um, to the point where um, none of it went well. I had a wheelchair off the plane eventually. I, I, um, we had to put her in a hotel in Atlanta. She slept for 14 hours straight. Um, so it did eventually work. Um, and I had to ring him up and I said, mate, I think you got your Saturday night pills mixed up with your sleeping pills. And then in the end, um, he agreed um, to, to, no, no, I think it's just a reaction. But that was all around the time in that book, Kate. So uh, that was a, an intriguing story that uh, never made it to air, just to hear. Sure. My goodness me, gosh, was Tash dancing up and down the aisles on that plane? Uh, she could see through the floor and she, she had a large hand and she thought that, uh, she, that I didn't belong to her anymore. Golly! Oh dear. Go on. And Andre actually went on to marry uh, Steffi Graf. So he did. Like, he did. But let me just let me let me oh. clarify by saying that he is one of the real gentlemen of our sport too. And we don't see him enough anymore. It's a real shame because he's articulate. He did a bit of coaching with Djokovic, of course, and that was reasonably successful. Um, but he is a really smart guy and I, I kind of miss that he's not as involved in tennis as some of the others are because I think he, he has so much more to give. But, you know, in a way, he probably, um, him and Steffi are such a super couple in the sense that it's, it's hard for them to be normal within our environment. Mm. Yeah, they're amazing, isn't it? To think that they actually got together after both winning Wimbledon in the same... It's a weird, it's a little different, I've got to say. <laughs> you wouldn't have thought it at the time, you know, no. back in the early 90s, you wouldn't have paired them off together. Uh, no. But obviously, very happy. Now, while we're talking about the big stars, and in the same company as yourself, Todd, out of the top three, so you've got Novak Djokovic, Rafa Nadal, and Roger mm. Federer, mm. who would be good value on a night out? Oh, well, um, uh, if you're vegan, vegetarian, or <laughs> that way, like, that's Novak for you. Um, is he really quirky? You said he was quirky. He's very quirky. Yeah, it's it, 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 it's he's very nice. Fascinating um, dynamics between the whole three. There's really two that get along and one that doesn't, and everybody's seen that. Um, and Rafa, fantastic guy, so pleasant, so honest, um, unbelievable manners. Looks everyone in the eye and says, you know, hello. Um, but but my Spanish is no good, and he's 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 it has to be Roger, you know. Uh, um, I've been lucky. I've interviewed Roger quite a few times for some corporate events. And he just sits there and just lets you into his life, everything about his life. Um, and for that reason, it's, uh, it's complete openness. And I think, I think he's the most entertaining of those three on a, on a social level. Okay. Um, there's, is it, there's a question that's come in from Robbie who uh, can't answer the question, but he did want to know that as Rafa is so superstitious, is mm. he aware that he's that superstitious and that those watching on television when he's doing this, this, <laughs> this, 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 is he annoyed that he's so superstitious as well? Um, yeah, he's aware. He's totally aware. Um, and, you know, most athletes uh, do those sorts of things. And he, it's about routine and rhythm and that's why he does them. Um, and, and, you know, it's about mental strength for him too, because people have tried to throw him off. People have tried to kick his bottles and throw balls down the end and change all that rhythm, but he's too smart for that. So um, I, think, I, I think for Rafa, he's, he's, he's unique. These guys are so different mentally to, to anything that we've really seen in, in most sports. To be able to, you can have champions do it for one, two or three years, but these guys are doing it for 15 years. Yeah. That hasn't been done before. You've got to think about Bjorn Borg as an example. Um, you know, he was gone before he was 30. Pat Rafter was gone at 30. There, there, there's so many of the, the greats that never made it um, with what these guys have been doing, particularly, particularly Rafa. Yeah. Uh, are Roger and Rafa good friends? Is it a forced friendship or yes. is it genuinely no. friendly? No, no, that mo most definitely. Um, I've always found fascinating, like charity-wise, um, 
you know, they've, they've helped each other out very, very deliberately to one's done something, I'll do that for you. And, and um, it wasn't always like that. You, you know, go back to other eras, for, for example, Jimmy Connors, he's got a great book too, sitting over, my, over there. It, he was so different to the rest of the world. He never, in fact, joined the ATP, which is Association of Tennis Professionals, the only oh, player good. never to become a member of our association. So um, that meant that whenever he went to tournament, he had to pay an entry fee, but he never joined it. Um, and so he was a complete loner within that community. So um, these two guys um, have never been like that. And, it, it, you know, these eras are very different. The era, Kate, when I first went um, to Wimbledon, was a very different locker room to the era... Um, that you have now to Federer coming up and talking and high-fiving everybody along the, the benches and whatever. I went into a locker room where Ivan Lendl, Boris Becker, Pat Cash, John McEnroe were all there. And they did not speak to you when you were young. They tried to intimidate you. Um, that is exactly how, how it was. And it's very different to that now. Um, even Pete Sampras in my era was... One day he'd say hello and talk to you. How are you going, Todd? What's going on? How's Natasha? The next day he never didn't remember my wife's name and wouldn't talk to me. And you, that's there. The games that get played behind the scenes. Um, but this group, very different to that. And it's 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 fascinating to um, actually have watched the locker room evolve. Wow, that is that is very interesting because when you think, um, so if you've got the men's semi-finals at Wimbledon and the first mm -hmm. semi-final goes on for five hours, it's one of those mm -hmm. epic matches, and so the the next semi-finalists are sitting there waiting to walk yeah. on the court. So are they actually hanging out in the locker rooms together? Yeah, yeah, there's one over there and one over there. In Roger's case, he'll be sitting in front of the TV and chatting often to an opponent like that. That's how he is. He draws them in a very different way. He doesn't beat them up mentally in there. He, he brings them in and softens them up and makes them close. Um, so I'm sure they're all parts of their strategy in a way, but yeah, it, it, it is uniquely different like that. Um, I, I um, qualified for Wimbledon for the very first time in singles when I was 17. My very first main draw singles match uh, was on the centre court. I played against the defending champion, Pat Cash. I'm Australian, that's Australian. He knew I'd qualified, he knew who he had to play. And um, in those days, there were three locker rooms. There was seated locker room, um, middle, if you like, and the low end. And I was in the low end. Um, so I was brought up into the seated locker room to be able to walk out on the centre court. He never even said hello. Never acknowledged that he knew me or that I was Australian. And they, they, those are the games that you had to play. Now, he was never not going to beat me. I was 17 and he was the defending champion. Um, but they're the lessons that you learn about, um, about the mental side of the sport as well. I once played, no, very quickly, I once played um, Ivan Lendl around the same time, a year or so later, qualified at a tournament. And um, I walked out, there was, a, there was a, the Lipton in those days in Miami, the big um, uh, tournament there. And I've walked out to play the world number one. I qualified again and I've walked out to the coin toss and Ivan is there on the other side of the net and uh, he looks at me and goes, hello, I'm Ivan, what's your name? And it's like, did you not look at the draw? Um, <laughs> and I said, oh, hi, I'm Todd. He says, oh, he says, I've got a dog named Todd. And, <laughs> and I was like, I was like oh. Oh. <laughs> so I had, I had no chance. But that, 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 was, that, that, was, the, that, that was that era, that's, that's how they went about it. Oh my God. Did you find yeah. you were serving throughout that match and standing there bouncing the balls going, oh, he's got a dog called Todd. This is great. Yeah. This is, uh, this is <laughs> I just thought, I, I actually felt like he was calling me a dog. So um, <laughs> I had no chance. Go chase the ball that I'm going to hit all around the court. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, he, um, Ivan, uh, Ivan Lendl does come across as rather surly. Well, certainly somebody who's not surly. And this is my brother-in-law, Tim, who is in England, who is a, a big tennis fan. And uh, Tim, your question for Todd. Hi, Todd. And uh, lovely to see you. I'm coming from sunny Sutton uh, near oh. Newcastle, which I gather you know quite well. A good friend of mine, Simon Wilson, who I gather you know. But that's another story. Um, can I ask you, uh, with regards to the era that you played in and you sort of bridged you bridged both eras um mm. if some of the players from the 80s were to play or the 90s were to play against the players today do you think the result would be very uh, 
cut and throw. It, it would be very shut and shut. In other words, uh, the players of today would beat the players of yesterday very easily, or would they adapt? Um, good question, Tim, because um, it, it, it depends on what racket you put in the hand and what string. And for me, more importantly, it's all about the string. So you will all have a really nice poly thing in your rackets right now that gives you some extra spin and a light frame. Um, I crossed over in many ways with um, uh, older technique. Video came in, Boris Becker came in with this amazing different technique on serve. Um, we got to watch that. Um, my serve over 20 years is completely different from when I started to when I finished. But the biggest change overall was the string. So if, if when I was playing, um, we came in a lot because we had very tight gut, natural gut strings. And when you came in, you had a trajectory that was quite low. So if you got someone pushed out of court, you could cover the net, get a volley into the open court. Now with these strings, when you get someone out wide, the string has this ability to, to throw the ball off the racket. So it comes off quick, it comes off much higher, and it can get a different shape back into the court. So that's got a twofold effect. It allows the person like a Djokovic, who's in a massively defensive mode, to, to, to throw the ball back in and get back into a neutral position in the court, and he resets. And then you've got to play another amazing shot to win the point. Um, so, so that's one of the key things. The other part is that when we were out wide, the ball just, it, we, we couldn't hit that same thing. So time was taken away from your opponent all the time. So I, I think if, if the eras that you mentioned had the string, they would have improved dramatically because I can still do things now I couldn't do in the early 90s um, because of the equipment. And all of those champions had great hands, great skills. They would have found a way um, to get there. Plus, let's not forget the greatest champions are the, are the greatest competitors with the greatest minds. And they still would have been able to do that. So um, that, that's where I, I see that, that game changing. The other thing is um, the string has made everybody a better server. Um, I didn't have a great serve. But everyone now serves harder. I serve harder now than I served in 95. That, that shouldn't happen, but that's what's happening. So um, the frames themselves didn't change so much, but the string made a massive difference to the way... Did, did, the, ball, the, did the balls make... Are the balls slower as well? Because I look back to Krychek and to Sampras, and they were serving, you know, 40... Or, 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 you know, 40... Uh, yeah. Uh, 40 yeah. aces a match. You know, keep we talking. I'm just. I'm going over here. Yeah, keep talking. I, I totally agree because in my office here. You know, I'm not that much. <laughs> I've got a selection of. Um, oh, it's not as good as I thought. They're, they're not in there. Um, but I, I every every final that I played in, I, I brought um, a Wimbledon ball home. This is 2015, so it's not one of the finals. Um, they're in there somewhere. Um, but over time, the the cover of the ball got thicker. Um, so the even is a bit shtick, Becker type serving finals. What they did is you could see the, the cover get thicker. So it got slower. So you were able to play um, off the baseline, get more balls back into play. So that was significant. But the, probably one of the biggest things at Wimbledon was the way they changed the grass surface. Because when I first went there, um, the outside courts, not so much the centre, but they were infiltrated what they call meadow grass. So a bird would fly by, fly by do a dropping and a seed got in there. They were much softer and played much lower. And I would call them, they were built from the earth. So it was just all dirt underneath them. Now every court at Wimbledon has layers of rock, gravel, shale, and it's built up to be absolutely perfect. They measure the moisture. They know how high it's gonna bounce, regardless of whether it's cold or whether it's rainy. And that has completely changed the way Wimbledon is because all of the baseliners um, can sit back and actually get a free hit at, at any passing shot. When I played early on, you come in, hit a short volley, and the ball would only bounce this high off the ground. So you had to play a chip or a lob, or you had to be really creative um, and have natural hands and ability. So uh, the club neutralised a lot of what happened at Wimbledon. And if, I think for me, I'd like it to be pulled back just a little bit so we get the contrast between more of attacking tennis and more defensive tennis. Um, probably not going to happen, but it would be far more exciting for me to see that. Yeah. Oh. Good question. Thanks, Tim. 
And uh, how much technology has evolved, not just in tennis, but in all sports. I know it's a hot topic of conversation. We're talking about Wimbledon. We're talking about another champion at Wimbledon, Todd. And this is a question from Jo, who lives. Uh, she, her family are from SW19. Uh, she, at her house, has Andy Murray's gold letterbox outside it. But Joe's question for you is, um, Boris Becker, great player. What's, what are your thoughts on him as a commentator? <laughs> Um, got to be careful. We all live in a glass house of commentary, Kate. Oh, oh um, and I know that very well. I know. <laughs> that. <laughs> um, is that the the, the letterbox in um, up in Scotland that you were talking about? Uh, no, no, because he's got one outside at Wimbledon as well, just up oh, the right. Church Road. Uh, so okay. yes, I've been. I've had my photo with his one in his hometown. Um, uh, Boris is a brilliant. Um, panelist uh, when you can uh, get him to articulate the things he went through um, what what might happen and all of that but I have commentated a few times with him in the box and he's unpredictable um, uh, because in commentary one of the really important things about a good combination is is like uh, you're right here in my box there Kate in, in the zoom and if we were in the box together we would be working off each other visually to know you know this is mine you go uh, and all of those types of situ situations. Boris sits here over here, like going like this, and occasionally chirps in, and you don't know what it might be. And so, as when you as a co commentator, he's actually hard to work with, um, but at the same time, uh, he's unique, um, and occasionally it's a, a pearl of wisdom that comes out. But it's a, a different scenario. I'd much prefer him when um, you have a host that can actually draw all of the right stuff from him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you get to work, I know as a commentator, it's not the same as being on centre court or on the Rod Laver court, but you do get to work with some great commentators. So, yeah. uh, yeah. very popular, but John McEnroe? Yeah, so um, I'm fortunate enough here in Australia um, the last couple of years uh, now, I've worked with Jim Career for many years oh. uh, with Channel 7 and now I work with Channel 9. Um, and we've had both McEnroe and Courier. <clears throat> they couldn't be more different. Um, when you work with Jim Courier, um, he's very much like the way he played and, and all our personalities tend to be that way. Um, so prepared, everything's talked about. We have our own production meeting before we go to air between the two commentators or three of us. Um, I genuinely lead with him because he's a former world number one, so I, 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 I sort of steer the, steer the courage. When we go to breaks, I'll ask him what he wants, what he's seeing, what I'm seeing, and then I'll, I'll lead to that. When you work with John, I'll ask John, you know, uh, anywhere you want me to take you, mate? Um, no, we'll just see what happens. But he's brilliant in a very different way because all of a sudden something in a match and he'll be off and you have to give him that space. So um, I've learned a lot over the last few years about how to lead these personalities. Um, but with John, um, the very first time I worked with him, I sat back a lot because I really needed him to know that he was in control of that. It was his space and I would do my best to showcase him. Because again, it's a bit like the locker room. These guys have a lot of egos and you've got to understand, I work in the hierarchy. I sit below him in the tennis playing hierarchy. I think you'll find the audience today will disagree with that. You've won 22 uh, Grand yeah. Slam titles, it's, Todd. So, it's, uh, it's okay. But <laughs> when I worked with Jim Courier, I beat him a couple of times, you see. So I've got, I've got a different relationship with him. I also, I also played with him, won a, a US play called Double title where we beat the Bryans in their first ever final together. There you go. There's a trivia question for you, Tennis Nuts. Wow. And to beat the Bryans, I mean, I know you are... You yeah, know, they weren't that good at that point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're, they're pretty special now, as, uh, as were you, with not just Mark Woodford, but also Jonas Bjorkman. And actually, you yeah. won Wimbledon last year, Todd. Uh, we yeah, watched the, old, the final. The old, the old farts, um, which was fun. Um, uh, it's amazing to get out and still get out on the grass and play. Um, we beat uh, an old rival of, uh, of the Woodies, actually, Mark, uh, Mark and I, Elting and Harhus um, from the Netherlands. Um, and Jonas became a really good mate. Uh, it was interesting to change partnerships with him. So in 2000, um, Mark and I finished our last match together at the Olympics um, in Sydney. Uh, it was the very last match we ever played. We lost the final, took home a silver medal. Um, and then I had the choice of who I wanted to play with. And I chose to play with Jonas Bjorkman because he was the player I disliked playing against the most. Um, and so I thought, all right, if I can't beat him, put him on my own team. 
And again, he had the ability to, to help gel and all of those things with me. Um, we went on and won five majors together, three Wimbledons in a row. Uh, and then he dumped me, Kate. Can you what? believe that? End of, end of the season in 2004, I went to play the last time of the year in Paris, rocked up. He pulls me aside, says, sorry, but we're not playing next year. I've got a new partner. I looked at him and gone, really? Um, this is a true story. No. And, I, and so his last tournament, I, I didn't know anything about it. Uh, he went on and played with Max Mirini. What he was telling me was that he says, I think you're starting to get to the end. Either you need to lift it a bit or, and focus or, you know, you're done. And in the end, he, I played um, the last six months with Mahesh Bhupati from India. Um, yeah. And we won a couple of tournaments together. Um, but it wasn't going to work for me. And so Jonas sort of kicked me into retirement. Um, but I actually thank him for it because I think it was perfect timing because I was 34 um, and it allowed me to go into a broadcast career. And I was still at the top of my game. Um, and and it, it meant that I could actually step straight in as a well-known character with form. Mm -hmm. And um, it was the right time. I, know, I actually don't regret it. it, was, it I look back on it going, how did you do that? But, but, and why do you do that? Because I had this goal in my own mind to actually go and win four in a row at Wimbledon. That was my goal um, because only two other teams had done that. That was Mark and I and the Doherty brothers in the 1800s. So I, I really wanted to achieve that, but we didn't get that chance. Yeah, but you, you don't regret that though. And you're pleased, you, you must be thrilled with how the last uh, 10, 15 years have gone. You're not just commentating on tennis, you're commentating on other sports as well. Yeah. We've had the chance to work together, COVID permitting uh, in Singapore each year at the women's golf. Yeah. Um, and I know there's a couple more questions that are coming in and Lisa Rowan, we'll get, uh, well, ask Lisa, who has to Please, be- Lisa, I've got Lisa. Lisa is front and center of my- Is she really? She, yeah. This will literally <laughs> make Lisa's Oh, entire and... lockdown if she gets the chance to ask you a question, Todd. So, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Hi, Todd. And hi, Kate. Thanks for doing this. Um, my question is, looking at all the top uh, best singles players in the recent era, who would be your dream mixed uh, double couple? And yeah. if there were two to play against each other, who would win and why? Uh, I, dream mixed doubles... Um... Yeah, I would have loved to have seen Steffi and Andre play, I think, and properly mm. at, in a major. That, that would have been cool. Steffi played a little bit of mix. She played uh, Wimbledon with John McEnroe one year. Um, uh, so I, I think they're the couple that we didn't get to see. I mean, I was fortunate enough to play with a lot of the great um, women champions. I played with Martina. I played with Arantxa Sanchez. Um, uh, I played with Lindsay Davenport. So I, I, I had those experiences as a player. And what was the second part, Liza, to the question? Well, if it was two couples, like for a fun match, you know, who yeah. would the two couples be? And why would you pair them and who would win? Well, you know, this was a, an actual combination. Um, it was Kim Clijsters and Leighton Hewitt. Um, mm. They were runner up at Wimbledon um, when they were actually dating each other. Um, I'd like to see them get back together and see if they could <laughs> reunite some chat at least um that didn't end up all that well but they're still uh, two people that i have really good relationships with and i have two really really good double space and great fun on the court to watch i'd love to see them back out there and probably playing um gee uh, martina hingis is uh I love yeah. watching her play. I think she's one of the greatest doubles players, men or women, that's ever played the game. For um, size, height, weight, ratio, she is brilliant. Um, and, I, and I'd put her maybe with John McEnroe because ah. you have two of the most skillful hands and technique isn't perfect with them, but my goodness, are they creative. They, the, if you think about what, what McEnroe could do with the ball and what Hingis does, I think they would probably be close to unbeatable. Could be fun. We could yeah. arrange it, right? <laughs> They'd still get out there. They'd all, we could get those four right now and they would play like such solid tennis. Yeah, it'd be good. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you. Good answer once again, Todd. Uh, we've got time for a couple more questions. And Julie, Julie is uh, keen to ask you a question, Todd. Hey, Julie. Hi Todd, thanks so much. Hi, Pleasure. Interesting. Um, my question was about your career um, 
just going back, who was or were the most challenging opponents that you faced? Mm. And mm. why, please? Well, um, usually in Singapore, I'm sure you all know um, some uh, Dutch um, people because they're always in shipping or something or other, and you would all come across them in the clubs. Uh, Jaco Elting and Paul Harhus for the Woodies um, were the team that we really struggled with. Um, and, and I guess they're like us in, in, um, in Holland. Um, the reason is um, we won more of the big tournaments than they did, um, but we actually had head to head, they were in front of us, um, which really we didn't like very much at the end of our career. But part of that had to do with, um, we would beat them outdoors. So all the majors are outdoors. Um, we have win factor and elements. So uh, Mark and I were really good at lobbying and using those elements to create space. Uh, Jakob and Paul were very powerful. Both had really good serves and really uh, hung over the net. And so when we played indoors, Mark and I didn't have the advantage of wind and left and right-handed service um, actions. And they would overpower us on, on that. So we played a lot of indoor tournaments at the beginning and ends of the year where they beat us. But when we got the right moment, whether it be US Opens and stuff, Wimbledon, we, we got them. So they were the, the, the really the hardest pair. And other than that, there wasn't a pair that we didn't feel like we could beat. We lost to people for sure. But we always, um, we used to have this little black book that we would put all our stuff in about how they beat us and how we were going to work out how to beat other teams. And that, that probably was why we ended up being as good as we were because we actually believed we would find a way to win. So, so that combo um, was the only one that we really worried about. Um, but we got him in a US final, we got him in a Wimbledon final, and, uh, and we got Paul in a Wimbledon and a French final. So, you know. <laughs> very, very good. That little black book, Todd, do you still have it? I don't know where it is, Kate. It's be somewhere around. I mean, um, our coach, Ray Ruffles, he, he um, used to have his as well. We'd all have our own ones. So they've got to be floating. Uh, Mark Woodford was a, is, is, a, is a writer. He, he just, he had piles of them in his house. I'm not so much. Okay. Okay. Now, this is the last question. But before we ask you the last question, um, Andy Martin, who joins us this afternoon. Now, Andy, uh, I think we're going to try and get to you if we can, because I know that you would love for Todd to say uh, some dear remarks to your mum. Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kate. Hey, Andy. Uh, th thanks, Todd. Much appreciated, mate. Really appreciate it. Um, so my mum is 70. She's actually not very well at the moment at all. Hasn't been well no. for, for a number of years. She, uh, she also played tennis for Scotland many, many years ago. But uh, yeah, she's a huge, huge doubles fan. And uh, I grew up obviously watching, watching you play and, and watching her watch you play. So mate, if you could uh, just uh, give her, a, her name's Ailsa, uh, nice Scottish name there for you. Yeah. yeah. Just give her a quick happy birthday, Ailsa. It's your 70th. Um, here you're a massive tennis fan. Something along those lines would be yeah. uh, massive. Obviously under COVID, we're putting together a little film for us. That'd be magic, mate. Got it. Yeah. G'day, Alza. It's Todd Woodbridge here. You find me in my office at home. Um, I understand that it's your 70th birthday and I will send you all my very best wishes. Um, I have such fond memories of coming over uh, to the UK. Got a couple of Wimbledon trophies snuck in the, uh, the, the window just behind me there. So you're getting a sneak peek into my home office. Um, I hope you have a, a wonderful day. Keep watching the tennis and I look forward to hopefully catching up with you very soon. Oh. That's awesome. Thank you so much. You have no idea how I appreciate it. Yeah. It's Don't a pleasure. Oh, and now Andy, Andy, remind me, because I could see him there, like, sipping away on a, it looked like a Heineken bottle. So um, I played... A tiny, mate. It's a Steiny. <laughs> oh, Steiny. Oh, because I, I played a lot of tennis in Singapore throughout my career. Very early, midway, I played the Heineken Open, Klang Tennis Centre, Singapore Island Country Club. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, very familiar with the, the old town there. Oh, wonderful. Great. Great message as well. And uh, yes, happy birthday to Elsa. Thank you so much. Uh, so, Todd, our, our final question. Uh, yeah. we, we're all chomping to get back onto the tennis court, but a f we won't have played for a couple of months. We're going to be a little bit stiff, maybe a little bit weak. What great advice 
do you have for us all here, certainly in Singapore that haven't played any tennis, to uh, when we start limbering up, getting back on the tennis court, what can we focus on to get us ready for our next LTS wit season, mixed doubles, doubles, singles championships that hopefully are on the horizon? You, you, well, I've just gone through the same thing with my golf. <laughs> So yeah, we just brought golf back uh, two weeks ago and I've had a couple of hits of tennis. Don't, I think it's really important, don't push too hard. Um, you really just have to ease your way back in. Um, I had a, a hit with John Fitzgerald, one of my great Aussie mates the other day, um, a major winner and world former world number one in doubles. And I kind of went for a couple of balls and tweaked my back a little bit. Um, so it's a bit colder back here in Melbourne, but just take it easy, nice and smooth. Don't try and hit too hard. It's the old, um, the old adage of uh, smooth is power, smooth is placement. Um, don't try and force it. So uh, the other part, which I'm very aware of, Kate, is um, the only real injury I had in my career was my elbow. And I, I hurt that actually at Queens Club in really cold weather coming back and trying to hit my serve too hard too quickly. Uh, one afternoon and that took me a couple of years to get over um, when you get out there and serve just hit I don't know 10 20 really just roll the arm over just to get it back going because um, that that's the time when you really can do some damage okay I like okay, that one more thing one more Go. thing for everybody going out and playing doubles this is my doubles tips as well early oh. in a set particularly in the first or second games, you must go down the line with your return, okay? Doesn't matter if you win or lose the point, nice and firm down the alley. What does that do? It says to your opponent, oh, hello, they're gonna be aggressive. It keeps your opponent at the net and stops them from moving a bit too much, okay? They get tentative. When they get tentative, they tend to give you more space, they move back a little bit, and then you can see more things and more areas to hit the ball into. That's one return. The other return I want you to use is the lob. And use the lob early again to create space and set things up. Be aware if there's breeze or not. You lob into the wind, you can't lob downwind. That's a, an obvious, but some people don't look at those particular things sometimes. Um, but if you can get out and do those, it can really help. The other part about going down the line early is when you get to four all, five all, or six all, and you haven't hit that one shot, all you've done is go for safety, it's very hard to take a risk when the score line is tight. But if you've made that shot already in those first few games, then the court looks so much bigger and under pressure, you can make whichever shot you want. Brilliant. <laughs> I've got lots of... I love it. I love it. You, now, Todd, what you've done, you've got us so excited about playing tennis and we still can't play tennis. So okay. we, we're each going to get our own little black book, start writing in them, talking about, yeah. you know, we're going to lob early, we're going to hit yeah. down the line. I love that yeah. line. Smooth is power, uh, smooth is placement. Okay, yeah. ladies and gentlemen who join us this afternoon, let's remember that the next time we are on the tennis court. But um, sorry for those of you that did ask a question. We didn't have time. We've just run over a few minutes past six o'clock here in Singapore. But Todd, thank you to you. We've raised over you know three and a half thousand awesome. dollars. Thank you, everybody. For I hope charity. I didn't bore you to death. <laughs> You certainly didn't do that. I know we're all inspired now. Before everybody goes, can I show you um, one of my most important trophies? For you, okay. certainly can. Um, uh, and the reason, the one I'm going to show you is not the one that you, you might um, all expect. So I'm going to go in here. Um, Kevin? It's on dream. Um, so this is my um, Olympic gold medal from Atlanta. Mm. Um, where's my camera? Can see and then that. We, I can, in terms of some and, of the detail, and I can. Oh, we've got say. someone chatting oh, on the phone there. <laughs> um, okay. And so the reason I show you this one is yeah, well, a lot of people ask me the question, and, and particularly here in Australia, they say um, tennis should not be in the Olympic Games, and I go, well, why not? Why? Well, we can we have the to to represent now. our country, and. When I, when I take this, I, I do these little tours with kids around Australia. Um, I go to primary schools and promote our hot shots tennis. I take my medals, so, my Wimbledon trophy and a Davis Cup trophy. And this one is and the one that going. kids grab it.
Oh, there we go. I'm, I think I'm back, am I? Am I back? Hmm. Yeah. So the, the, the reason I adore this medal is, is because people that don't know tennis all of a sudden have an interest in tennis. And I think this, uh, for Mark and I, made us pure household names in Australia. So it's um, one of those really unique things. And I look back at it and think, well, um, that was pretty cool. So this was Atlanta uh, in 96. Yeah, go. and Todd, I feel bad that we haven't actually spoken about that gold medal because what an achievement it was. Yeah, it, it was um, a, an achievement in, in more ways than one because um, if anybody's read my book, there's not many um, probably out there, but Atlanta was a challenge because um, it, it, we were under massive pressure. The whole country at that time had sort of like ticked a gold medal in the, the box for Australian medals. And that was the great, and that's another reason why I, I love it so much is that that was the greatest pressure we ever played under. Um, because you're not doing it for yourself, just for your combo, you're doing it for the whole country. And that's why it is harder. There's no money like on it, there's nothing. It's just about pure pride. And um, I think when I look back at that, getting through that was really, really one of the most great things that, that I was able to achieve mentally because um, yeah, the, the Australian public expect a lot and you, and you have to present it to them. And so that, that was really an incredible moment. Oh, wonderful. And a lovely story to finish on. Uh, I know I'm looking around, I'm on gallery view now and looking at everybody who's joining us this afternoon all around the world. And, um, yeah. and actually what we would like to do is if um, Ash is going, if you can unmute yourself guys, if we can give uh, Todd a big round of applause and um, we're going to all smile. Everybody smile at the camera. the way. Uh, well, there's a few. There's Cambridge. There's Cambridge Monkeys. Who okay, amazing. We will get. But it's worth asking. I just think we'll end up with not tennis, and uh, we are. Ah, now, sorry. just to conclude, uh, Todd, we do hope to have you here in Singapore uh, post-COVID. Uh, you worked last year at the Women's Golf at the HSBC yeah. Women's Champions. I'm hoping you're going to be back next February. Well, I would love to be. I mean, that's my plan. I want to be back, Kate. If you can make sure I get back on the, the team, I'll be back. And maybe we'll just have to tell our, um, our producer that, you know, we've got to catch up with all of these people here in real life back at the club so it, it can actually feel normal. That would be great. And I'd, be, I'd love to do that. Very good. Well, I know that we would yeah. all love to see you next February in Singapore. So thank you. Have a wonderful evening. And thank you to everybody for joining us this evening. I hope you had a good gin and tonic. You've got your yeah. little book started with top advice and uh, some wonderful stories from Todd's remarkable career. So thank you, everybody. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers. Bye, everyone. Thank Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank Thanks you. Bye. Thanks, Todd. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks so much.